Welcome to the Alt Swift X Game of Thrones Abridged podcast, in which we speed, we 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 sprint through the pages, we we rush across the paper so fast and 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 so incisively that we get we get fucking paper cuts on our calluses because we are, we are smashing through the text like like an icebreaker ship through and through an iceberg of of sheer words, shattering them into little particles of discourse, powder snow gently falling down like ash on King's Landing. Today, we are talking about magic and politics coming crashing together like an immovable force and an unstoppable object, and I'll let you pick which is which. They are Butting heads, the arcane and the mundane, like 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 a couple of fucking ornery rams smashing heads. You ever seen like 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 deer, like reindeer, like smashing their antlers together, or like a couple of giraffes swinging their necks around like golf clubs to smash their tiny peanut giraffe brains into each other at Mac Ten? That that is magic and politics coming together and they they do not mix you see magic and politics they are fundamentally juxtaposed like 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 oil and water they don't mix like 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 fucking milk and sardines they don't jam they don't marmalade they don't come together and there is conflict between that meeting of the ice and fire the dichotomy is a place of conflict, and from that conflict, character tension rises to drive our characters into heretofore undiscovered places, and welcome to the stream. Today we are covering Bran 2, A Clash of Kings, which is the second Bran chapter in the second book. Uh, we're, we're 221 pages into this book, and we're basically still setting things up. We're still setting the ground rules, because George Martin likes to... He likes context. You can't fault George Martin for providing adequate context, or indeed adequate food descriptions. We're laying the groundwork for Bran's future uh, of magic and of and of green sight and of the destiny of Westeros, but first we have to do an awful lot of table setting, literal and otherwise. So let's get into it. The first line of this chapter is... Long before the first pale fingers of light pried apart Bran's shutters, his eyes were open. And there's about seven things that I'd like to discuss about this first line. So so the first pale fingers of light, we're talking about dawn, which is similar to the first line in Bran's first chapter. Let me Let me pull that up real quick. What was the first line? It's something about dawn, isn't it? Bran... One, A Game of Thrones says, The morning had dawned clear and cold, with a crispness that hinted at the end of summer. Bran's opening lines are all about the dawn and light, uh, juxtaposed with the darkness and the winter, which relates to his magical destiny to overcome the White Walkers and save the world, and mayhaps to become king. Um, and I think that there are very strong hints that Bran's final chapter at the end of Game of Thrones might end in a similar way. Uh, Daniel Abraham is a writer who wrote a series called The Expanse about some spaceships and some zombies and things, and, um, and he also wrote the Game of Thrones comic book adaptation of the first Game of Thrones book. There are these comic books, and, and Daniel Abraham was talking to George Martin when he was writing the comic book, because it was his job to decide which parts of the books would be kept in the comic and which would be cut out, because if you tried to fit the entire book, then the comic book would be even fatter than the regular book, and let me tell you, the regular book is thick. Um, so the point is that Daniel Abraham had to find out, okay, which bits are essential, which bits are the most important of these first chapters of the Game of Thrones book. And as a result of that, Daniel Abraham has said that he knows what the final line of the Song of Ice and Fire series is. And we know that that line must somehow relate then to something that happens in the first few bits of the first Game of Thrones book. And and one of the sort of leading theories that I think is true is that is that 
is that Bran has that last line, and I think it's a real good bet that that last line is something something similar to these opening lines of, of these chapters talking about the dawn. I think after the winter, after the darkness, after the apocalypse, we will have Bran at the very end saying, you know, the, the winter sure is frosty and, and crispy on the nips, but at least there's hope of sunshine on the next spring morn. I think that might be what the last line of A Song of Ice and Fire is. I think that would make a lot of sense. But Christ on earth knows how long we'll have to wait before that line is published. Thanks for the super chat from Lucas, who says YOLO swag. Uh, Second thing I'd like to say about the first line of this chapter is that it says that Bran's eyes were open. And that's something that happens throughout this chapter and throughout the other chapters of Bran's arc that are all about his open eyes, the seeing and the watching that he does. Because since he's lost his legs and he's not playing as much hockey as he used to, Bran is using his other body parts, you know? He's using his weenus on, on, on his elbows, he's using his, his earlobes, he's using all those, all those obscure parts of the body that you don't even notice exist until you have to, because you're not, you're not using the, the, the legs that you used for kicking, you gotta, you gotta kick with your face, you gotta get creative is what I'm saying, and Bran starts to use his eyes as a way of interacting with the world even more than he ever did before. Let's move beyond the first line. There were guests in Winterfell, visitors come for the harvest feast. So this is a time of autumn, or, or fowl, as fall. It's, it's fall. That's what the Americans say, because it's a time of change. All the little leaves are falling from the, from the trees, uh, and we're having this seasonal change from the warm, prosperous, safe, happy time of summer down to the cold, dangerous time of winter. And and a Clash of Kings at the start of the book is all about that magical seasonal change. There's a lot of talk about red comets, and there's a lot of talk about prophecy and portents, and this is what that is all about. So uh, there's a feast to commemorate the autumn, uh, and Bran is thinking about how that once would have been exciting for him, but it's not exciting for him now, because Bran has to play this political role, since, uh, you know, spoilers, there's a war going on right now, uh, because the Starks and the Lannisters are at each other like a, like a, like a cat trying to get some... some you, you, you know what I mean. Uh, and the Walders are around, which enrages Bran. He doesn't want to deal with these Walders. He's going like, Walders, like he's grumbling, like like Dinkelberg, like what's the meme? He's He doesn't like the Walders. Well, the Walders are like his nemeses. And, you know, there's always a pattern about uh, characters having like low-grade enemies early on in their story. Like the Walders are a problem for Bran right now, but you just know that in you know a couple of books it's going to be the White Walkers and the Night King who he has to contend with. So there's an upgrading. It's like in a video game. Like the first boss is you know a junior Goomba, and then your second boss is a Cooper Trooper on roids, and then the final boss is, you know, Bowsertron 5000 himself. There's an upping of the stakes, and the Walders are sort of the low-grade nemeses for Bran at the start. So, Maester Lewin is sort of Bran's mentor at this point, and he's saying, we got to work out what lordship is all about, broski. But Bran is like, I never wanted to be a prince. I wanted to be a knight. I wanted to run around on, on me legs, and I wanted to have a horse between those legs, phrasing um and brand's like why should i have to sit around listening to old men speak of things that he only half understood and that is that is some that is some foreshadowing right there because when brand goes and meets old old tree man blood raven he does nothing but sit around listening to old men speak of things he only half understands. That's what happens with Bran and Bloodraven in the cave. He sits there with Bloodraven rolling off this magical, magical gobbledygook, and Bran's like, this is exactly what I hoped to avoid. Bran keeps getting shafted. All he all he has wanted is, like, adventure and, and cool, fun times, but all he gets is fucking exposition. Uh, so Bran's fate is a cruel one. So he's having to deal with all this political crap while Rob is down south and Ned is dead and uh, it's a bad time. So 
He's hanging out at Winterfell, and he has a duty to, to be Rob's heir and to be the Stark in Winterfell. Even though he's only like nine years old or something, he has to play this great role. Let's turn the page. Um, and a whole bunch of lords of the north are coming for the feast. Uh, Wyman Manderley, first and foremost among them. Uh, the, the lord who's too fat to sit a horse. But as we soon learn, he may be fat, but he's no fool. He's, a, he's an ambitious political schemer, which is much like a lot of other fat people in this story. It's like Illyrio Mopatis. It's sort of this archetype of, the, of, the, of inner society that values like martial skill and traditional brawn and masculinity. These, these fat guys have to find other ways to be useful and powerful in the story. In the same way that like you know Brienne doesn't fit like a traditional feminine ideal so she finds alternative ways uh, outside of that restrictive role for her to for her to deal uh, for, her, for how to interact with the world and indeed that's what ha that's what's happening with Bran he can no longer fit with like the traditional archetypical masculine lordly role that he's expected to play so therefore he goes down this magical magical path so Game of Thrones is full of this exploration of like what society expects you to do and how you can adapt to 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 work out your own individual possibilities within those restrictions. Uh, and Wyman Mandley is bringing all this all, this whole damn party to Winterfell. There's there's lords and ladies, heralds, musicians, a juggler, all a glitter with banners and surcoats and half a hundred colors. This is, this is like, um, George Martin has this quote about, like, what fantasy means to him, and it's like, you know, fantasy is vermilion and, and lapis lazuli and, and grease running down chins, and he, and he has all these, like, a, all these colorful purple prose to describe, like, like the, the essence of fantasy to George Martin is all about color and vibrancy and, and exoticism and all these different sensory experiences and that's why George is constantly richly describing all these things and so Wyman is bringing that, that fantastical vibe uh, to Winterfell but unfortunately Bran has to deal with the political side because he has to sit on his father's high stone seat with direwolves carved into the arms which is something that they didn't emphasize enough in the show, I think. Like, the show did not have many thrones going on, apart from the Iron One, and it didn't have many crowns going on. In fact, were there any crowns in the entirety of the Game of Thrones show? I don't... I don't think there were. As best I can... No, well, no, there was Sansa, the Queen of the North. She got a crown at the end of her... Story. Oh, and Renly. Renly wore a crown in season two. But we never saw Stannis wear a crown. And I, I'm pretty sure we didn't see Rob wear a crown. Oh, oh, King Robert. King Robert wore a crown in season one. Uh, yeah, and Cersei had a crown in, se in season seven. That's right, Sol. Jo yeah, Joffrey wears a crown in, like, season three, season four. Yeah, that's a good point, Semka. Yeah, so so some people did have crown. Yeah, Tommen in season six. Yeah, so some people did have crowns throughout the show. So they th they didn't totally not do it. And yeah, there was the Driftwood crown with Euron and Balon. I think. Does Marjorie wear a crown, Hedus? Yeah. Well, all right. A bunch of people did wear crowns, so that's good. Um, but there's certainly a lot less crownage than is going on in the books because the books are constantly emphasizing like the political trappings, that the imagery of power. Um, and part of that is not just the crowns, but the thrones. Um, there's not just the Iron Throne, there's the sea stone chair on the Iron Islands made of that Lovecraftian greasy black stone. Um, and the Starks have this stone chair with Winterfell, with, with, with direwolves carved into it, which sounds uncomfortable. Um, you know, you know, in the real world, there's a chrysanthemum throne, which is, which is the throne of the emperors of Japan. Isn't that dope? The chrysanthemum crown is in like the flower, the chrysanthemum. I'm sure there's like a really dope Wikipedia page about like list of thrones Wikipedia. Do you reckon there's like a list of dope ass thrones? So yeah, it's just giving me a bunch of like Game of Thrones results. Stop, stop bloody typecasting me. Um, uh, heirs to the throne. Yeah, all right. Well, I'm sure there's some other cool thrones. Anyway, we're not getting distracted. Uh, we're talking about the the trappings of power at Winterfell. 
the high stone seat with the dire wolves and all that stuff's important and Roderick says, yeah, man, like, Wyman is bringing, like, a bunch of jugglers and, and whatever, and he's, but, but a man does not cross a hundred leagues for a sliver of duck and a sip of wine. Only those who have matters of import to set before us are like to make the journey. So Wyman has ulterior motives, is what we're learning here. He has ambitions. He's not just here for the duck, but Wyman is certainly going to partake in the duck, because, like, you know get you a man who can do both, right? Like, get a man who can eat 15 ducks in one sitting, and a man who can, like, do Machiavellian political machinations to grow his 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 feudal holdings, right? Like, why, like do it, ha- have it all, man. Have it all. Get some grease on your chin and get a crown on your head. That's how a man should live. All right, so, so we're saying that Wyman has ambitions. Uh, and Ned would always remind Bran that winter is coming and you have a duty. And so that's saying that, you know, you need to be a political player here. You need to represent the Starks politically. But at the same time, like, winter is coming is not just a political statement. That is that is a magical statement. That is, that is the White Walkers are coming. So I don't think it's... I think there's sort of mixed messages there, right? That's, that's a subtle reminder that it's also necessary to deal with the White Walkers. Thanks for the donation from C. Saint who says, Swift, you're an absolute gem. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, CS. Am I Lapis Lazui or am I or am I uh, Amethyst? I've always been partial to, to diamonds, personally, because um, they're just so pretty. Uh, so Hodor comes bustling in. Sli- it's not sliming, but smiling and humming tunelessly. And he's helping... Bran to get dressed. Bran likes to dress himself when he can, but he has trouble pulling on his pants and lacing his boots. That vexed him. You can only imagine how frustrating it would be to lose that ability, as many people struggle with in the real world. Um, and sort of part of the story of, of, of Bran, of course, is that as he loses agency and control of his own body, he starts to inhabit other bodies, like the body of his wolf, Summer. Uh, and indeed uh, other humans, because Bran later starts to warg into Hodor's body in Book 5, which is considered an abomination to to take over another human's body. And I think there might even be like hints of that very early on in this very chapter, because Bran looks at these squires who are fighting in the yard, and, and Bran wishes he was one of them so badly that his stomach hurts with the wanting. Bran is wishing to inhabit those people's bodies almost i think i think this longing to be outside of his own situation is part of what enables brand's magic to to escape his own body so um uh peter in the chat says that wyman being too fat to ride a horse mirrors bran because he has to rule but he can't move well yeah i think that's a really great point peter um, it, it, it ties into that broader concept of characters not being able to play the role that they're expected to play uh, by society, so they have to find some alternative method of wielding power, and that's what Wyman does with his political genius, and that's what Bran does with his magical wagicals. So, uh, Bran gets his pants on one way or another, and he, and he marvels at how Hodor is so gentle, but also he has astonishing strength. Uh, but Hodor looks at Bran with guileless brown eyes, eyes innocent of understanding, and Hodor says, Hodor. So I, I can't help but think in this moment that, that something so horrible is going to happen to Hodor, like, like for sure. He's, he's like Bambi, you know? He's just so sweet and innocent, like a little puppy dog slipping on his own tail. Uh, but And that just makes it all the more heartbreaking when, when Bran later takes advantage of Hodor by taking his body and does all this horrible stuff. And I think that'll only get darker. Like, in these later books, like, in A Dance with Dragons, Bran is already starting to do fucked up stuff by, by walking into Hodor. Uh, and I think in the winds of winter, when things get really dark, that'll be when things get bad. I, I think that perhaps Bran's big conflict in the winds of winter will be that temptation towards the the dark side and the excess and the, and the selfishness of magic power. And I think the representation of that is Euron Greyjoy, right? Because Euron is the ultimate 
example of someone who's consumed by power and the idea of power uh all he cares about is his own self-aggrandizement he's lost any kind of connection with like social norms of like how to not be a massive eldritch cunt uh and as it turns out that's important because if you, if you lose touch with what is moral behavior then you are completely uh, sent into a s spiral of, of squids and sacrifice. So Bran might might suffer the same kinds of temptations, and Bran might need to find some kind of human reconnection in order to avoid that sociopathic psychosis, but remains to be seen. Um, so yeah, I think things are going to get bad with with Hodor. Uh, and so there's a new there's a new strat. Got a new got a new le me method of locomotion. Uh, they've got a basket that that hangs on to Hodor so that the paralyzed Bran can can ride upon it like a, like a Yoshi rush running across the plains on a noble noble Yoshi steed. Um, and so and and it's like a hot air balloon actually because that's a basket as well, isn't it? I like to think of Hodor as a as a balloon from which Bran hangs, like like Lee Scoresby in his Dark Materials. We have gotta make that's his Dark Materials is cool. Okay, um so he he's floating around like a hot air balloon and Hodor says Hodor and Bran recalls that there was one time when Hodor was like basketing around and all of a sudden he smelled hot bread baking and i don't know if you've ever seen a hodor catch the scent of hot bread because oh boy who doggy he sprinted to the kitchens like usain bolt and and since bran was in the basket he cracked his head against like the stone door top and and smashed up his head and lewin had to sew up his scalp which which actually is suspiciously similar to what uh to what the the three-eyed raven the three-eyed crow is trying to do to bran because in bran's visions bran's crow dreams and things he has this 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 crow pecking at his forehead to to find his third eye um and 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 the third eye is of course a metaphor for unlocking your magic power and your green sight and being able to see into that mystical realm that only cats and magicians and carnies can see that's what the third eye does um and conventionally that belongs on the forehead though of course that's not always the case my, my uncle Furbert had his third eye located on his gooch um because that's just what happens sometimes it's really the luck of the draw um uh, my other my other cousin uh, uh Weginald, uh had her third eye on on a on a weenus uh she had two of them actually four eyed four eyed four eyed cousin what was her name I've already forgotten but she's she had so many mystical eyes um but uh but she didn't have 2020 vision it was she had pink eye on one of her weenus eyes and it really got in the way of her spells um so my point is that if you've got a forehead, third eye, you're lucky. And that is indeed what's happening with Brown. No, but my point is that, that when Brown gets a crack on his forehead, um, in just the same way that the Three-Eyed Raven was trying to to cut through Brown's forehead to open up his third eye, maybe Hodor, theory, fan theory, maybe Hodor was actually warged into by the Three-Eyed Raven in order to smash Bran's head to unlock his powers, maybe that maybe that bread was no coincidence. I mean, I mean the bread might have been baked by uh by by old Nan, and old Nan, as we know, has has eldritch knowledge, as as all Nans do to varying degrees. So, you know, I wonder if that bread incident might have been orchestrated by the Raven to unlock Bran's powers. Anyway, so that's something that happened, um, and Bran looks out at those squires, uh, and he's and he's longing to 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 be able to run around like they are, uh, and they're training by fighting against these Lannister lions on shields when they're when they're running, they're jousting and stuff because of course we're at war, and you got to have a bit of propaganda. You got to remember who the bad guys are. You got to point the peasants in the right direction and say stab those many fuckers with the with the lions you gotta make things easy so you got that symbology that's why they're all dressing up with lions and 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 stags and and 
flowers. You got to know who's who, otherwise things get real confusing. So that's happening, and Bran is learning to ignore stairs, and he looks at the Walders, who have all this fancy armor. So there's Little Walder, and there's Big Walder, and the Big Walder is little, and the Little Walder is big, because George Martin has a severe allergy to keeping things simple. When, when, whenever George Martin has a thought, he just breaks out in hives until he can find a way to add an extra second cousin and an alternate uh, theory and an allusion to thing and a description of food. George Martin does not like simplicity, um, but but that's why these books are long and cool. Um, by the way, I'll note that Big Walder is descended from someone in House Blackwood. And House Blackwood, as we know, has old gods connections, so I wonder if it was actually Big Walder who warged into Hodor to make him run at the bread to crack Bran's head to make him magic. Fan theory. See how easy it is to make theories? Anyone can do it. And they talk about how Big Walder and Little Walder, who were like wards of, of Winterfell, um, as part of the deal to let Rob cross the the twins i think i think that was i think that was the deal and that's why the walders are here at winterfell and the walders are like the walders are like 10 years old and yet they're like they're like really fucking evil they're like in the fifth book of dance with dragons the walders are hanging out with ramsay bolton and and ramsay gets the walders to bring theon as reek from the dungeons to the banquet hall and like and like and like Theon's all fucked up and he's like tortured and stuff and and like the like the ten year old Walders are expected to like transport this prisoner and it's just bizarre like it's crazy to me how these like ten year olds are expected to to do all these fucked up things but that's feudalism isn't it like that's just as ridiculous as like nine year old Bran being expected to represent the ancient Stark dynasty in these wartime political negotiations and he's just he's just a fucking kid who just who not a week ago got got semi severe brain trauma from a, a, a bread incident so so riddle me that Batman um so let let's go on to the next page uh, ooh, we tore that a little bit. Remember, turn your pages gently, not not too vigorously. Okay, so uh, so little Walder strikes harder blows, but Big Walder sits his horse better. So they've got a little bit of like a master blaster dynamic, where like little Walder, who's the big one, is like the sort of tough guy, whereas Big Walder, who's the littler one, has 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 the smarts. You know, Wh- which is the same sort of dynamic as uh, as Hodor and Bran have. Bran is the master, Hodor is the blaster, and we haven't really seen the uh, the blasting bit from Hodor yet, but uh, but I'm sure we soon shall. I mean, that did happen in the show in Game of Thrones season four. We saw Bran warg into Hodor and and go 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 beast mode, full Hodor mode on on their asses, which which was presented as it rightly should have been as this really like upsetting moral situation because Hodor, poor sweet innocent big brown eyed puppy dog Hodor looked down after the after the violence at his bloodied hands like Macbeth um and had to like grapple with with such a sweet innocent person being being turned into a monster and that abomination is going to be a big deal in Bran's future I think um so we got the Walders and uh the Walders approach Bran and say my that's an ugly horse uh talking to Hodor and Bran explains that, well, I think you'll find that this uh, Hodor is not a mammal of the hoofed variety, but is in fact a man, and a seven-foot tall one of that. Um, no, he doesn't say that. Uh, but they're just teasing Hodor, and, and Hodor, it breaks your fucking heart, because while these Walders are trying to tease Hodor for, for, being, a, for being an ugly horse, which, while we're at it, is the same insult that, 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 that uh, Arya is insulted with. Remember when remember when Arya is called Horseface by by Sansa and Jane and stuff? Hodor is also called a horse. I don't know what's so offensive about being called a horse. Horses are badass. They got twice as many feet as a human, at at least twice as many hooves. They've got lustrous manes. They can run at like Mach twelve. 
Horses are great. I would. I. It's. It's hardly an insult. But anyway, that they're, they're teasing. They're teasing Hodor, and Hodor just beams genial, gen, genially, genially. I never learned how to pronounce that word. And he just says Hodor, Hodor, Hodor. Oblivious to their taunting, he's such a sweetie. I, I, you know what would be great though is if, like, in the middle of the winds of winter, we just suddenly, out of nowhere, a propos of nothing, a a Hodor POV chapter. Like, can you imagine turning the page in the winds of winter? And you just turn the page, and it and it says Hodor one, and it's the first Hodor chapter. And like, you're expecting that, like, okay, George Martin is pulling a April Fool's joke, and it's just going to be pages and pages full of Hodor, Hodor, Hodor. W- wouldn't it be like the the greatest like five thousand IQ troll of all time? Um, if if the Winds of Winter came out and it was just all Hodors. No, what they should actually do is like when the Winds of Winter comes out, uh, touch wood, um. Like like one in a thousand copies, like like most of them are normal, but but like but some of the copies, a small percentage, are just like a like a shiny Pokemon. Every word is replaced with the word Hodor, just just as like a little perk, just as like a little thing. And like you'd be outraged if you bought the Winds of Winter and it was just full of the word Hodor, like at first. But like this would become a collector's item. Like, can you imagine how much the fans would get excited about the ultra rare like minority of Winds of Winter copies that are all Hodors? I th- it would be like the, it would be like the golden ticket in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and if you find one of the extremely rare Hodor Hodor Hodors, Winds of Hodor, then you'll get to go to George Martin's house, and he'll show you all of his um, glistening chins, and he'll give you a tour of the of the of the boiled leather factory that George has. I think that would be cool, and and of course everyone who buys a Hodor copy will want to buy a regular copy as well. Um where where was I going with that? Um let me let me think. No, my point is I honestly don't know how we got there. No, wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be cool if you if you turn the page in the winds of winter and then it said Hodor and you're like, okay, we've got a Hodor chapter. Alright, George, like what's a fucking Hodor chapter? But then but then instead of going Hodor, 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 you just read it and it's like day five. I've been carrying this recalcitrant lordling in the back of my basket for seventeen, uh, 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 e- even even days uh, since we left the cave, and uh, my thighs are aching, and nobody has offered to carry the the briskets for me, and yet I think as I gaze upon the the distant horizon, what what new challenges might this new morrow bring, and and might and not the blood raven's true identity henceforth be crucial for the current events in the kingdom like wouldn't it be great if hodor was just like a like a philosopher king who just had these deep ass thoughts but when he tries to express them he just says hodor 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 I'd like that. Um, anyway, so they're, they're having a fight. They're having a tiff. Like like the Walders and Bran. There's, there's some teasing. There's some there's some hormones rising up. There's splashing about. Everyone's getting a bit testosterone-y, or at least as much as a bunch of ten year old boys can. Um, and uh, and Bran threatens the Walders and says, "Summer would tear your head off." And little Walder says, Ah, does your wolf have steel teeth to bite through our mail? And he bangs a mailed fist against his breastplate. So they are, like, quite seriously threading violence against each other. Um, did, did you ever see the Romeo plus Juliet, the Baz Luhrmann uh, movie adaptation of Romeo and Juliet? Not really related, but there's, like, some great scenes. Because the thing is, they... they, they <laughs> The thing is, th- th- they adapt the Shakespearean old-timey story of Romeo and Juliet into, like, this semi-contemporary uh, story where, like, the houses of Montague and Capulet are not, like, these feudal families. Uh, they're, they're these corporate empires in, like, modern America. And instead of having, like, swords, they have they have guns. Like, like, like Lord Montague or whoever has, has a massive fucking blunderbuss that's called... Longsword is the name of his blunderbuss, and it's got like a engraving on it that says its name. Um, but my point is that I don't know. I just th- this scene reminded me of the scenes where like uh where 
where like Tybalt and Romeo uh, are just talking mad smack at each other. They're just like flighting like the Norse. They're just like rap battling. They're just like they're just like slinging absolute shit talking at each other. And it's just a great time. I think I think that's an art that that kind of needs to come back. You know, J- just like people slagging each other off, but like having fun with it. And I think the introduction of weapons is where it gets gnarly, you know, because like it's all fun and games until someone, until someone gets hurt. And if you just do the bit, if you do all the fighting up until someone actually getting hurt, I feel like that has all the benefits of like letting off steam and like, you know, getting a bit aggro and bolshy without actually causing uh, massive blood loss, you know, which 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 it, it remind it, it's also similar to that scene in book 1 where uh where Tom and no what happens Joffrey and and Rob get get all mad at each other in book 1 and they start threatening each other it's quite a similar scene uh and that sort of set up a fight a future fight between Joffrey and Rob which never ended up happening if i recall rightly the original 1993 um outline of the Song of Ice and Fire trilogy, as it was at the time. The plan was for Rob to maim Joffrey on the battlefield, if I'm remembering that rightly. Someone might be able to correct me. Um, but, but yeah, it's that sort of early tiff that's setting up a future conflict. Although, there is no further conflict between Bran and the Walders, as far as we've seen. So, I'm not sure where that's going. Anyway, um, so... Just like in book one, if I remember rightly, that fight between uh, Rob and Joffrey is interrupted, as this fight is, with Maester Lewin, who who cracks through the clangor of the yard as loud as a thunder thunderclap when he says, Enough! And he ends the fight, and he says, Hey, you guys might be all bolshy, but you gotta be, you gotta be respectful, alright? Because we've gotta at least pretend to like each other, because this is politics, bro. Is this how you behave at the Twins? What is the root of this? Um, and, uh, and, and Big Walder says, Oh, you know, never mind, kindly maester. We were merely having a little jape, a little jest with Hodor. I am so sorry if we offended the Prince Bran Stark. We only meant to be amusing. So Big Walder is the, is the eloquent, lying, silver-tongued one. He's the little one. And then Little Walder, who's the big brutish one, looks peevish and says, And me. And and anyone who has siblings knows that and me is 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 it's the it's the easiest laziest move in the book because you get your other sibling to to do the work for you of explaining this is why we were up at midnight stealing all the ice cream from the from the ice cream cabinet um and and then you go to all the work of explaining everything and then your bloody sibling just walks up and says oh me too and they and they just like they just they just rest on your laurels you know all over your bloody laurels. They're just hoisted up by your petard. Um, I don't know if I don't know if that's uh, yeah. My 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 great uncle once once had this whole situation with the law, where there was a misunderstanding about the ownership of of a ranch in Southern California. Um, and, and long long story short, there was a bout of arson. There was a there was a small outbreak of of um of polio. Uh, and and there was a polygamous marriage between between five different stable boys um, that all happened in the same night, um, and it was this whole nightmare uh, that that was basically orchestrated by by my uncle and his uh, uh, his sister, and um, and after they had all this drama and they were brought to the high court of the land and and they had to do all this explain and and, and the and my uncle had to do all the legal work and he. You know, he read all the books and he got calluses on his thumbs from leafing through these these eighteen hundreds legal books to to get the defense that he needed to explain the arson and the polygamy. But um, and after he did all that work and he and he got them off scot free, uh, they then turned to his sister to say, "Well, what what say you?" And she just said, "And me," and she got let off as well. So so let that be a lesson to you all. Um, so, Lewin says, a good lord comforts and protects... Uh, fucking, I got a speech impediment today. A good lord comforts and protects the weak and helpless, 
he tells the phrase. And, and that is one of these sort of like premises, one of these concepts that A Song of Ice and Fire constantly interrogates and questions and undermines. This concept of what is a good lord? What is a bad lord? What's the difference? And why does it usually not work out that way? Because, spoiler, there's an awful lot of bad lords uh, throughout this story. Um, uh, the, there's, there's brutal lords and absentee lords and, and good lords who act bad and bad lords who act good and 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 the Starks try to uphold those those good values, although they've been mostly AWOL for a lot of the story now. All right, we've got, to, we've got to pick up the pace, actually, because we're like three pages in, and there's quite a few pages left. So speed round, lightning round. All right, listen up. Buckle on your, your, your book belts. Okay, so Lewin is like, you've got to be a good lord and not a shit lord. Uh, and Lewin says, hey, Bran, uh, you were right to defend Hodor, but you're meant to be doing politics right now. So hurry up, Bran, uh, slap on the rump, get in there and be a lord. Uh, and Lewin says, look, I know you're trying to be a good kid, but but let's let, let's move on with it. Speak nothing but courtesies until uh, Lord Wyman or Roderick gives you a question because he's moving in to meet the Lord Too Fat a Horse. Uh, and Bran says, okay, I'll do what you say, I'll remember. And of course, the word remember is always significant um, with the Starks because the North remembers all manner of things. Not just not just betrayals, but also the the history of the long night. So he goes in and he meets the the fat Lord Manderley, uh, and Bran is like, "Ah, oh, I'm sorry, I'm late. I got caught up, had to bang some heads together. You know how it is." And Wyman's like, "No, no, 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 no. A prince is never late. He arrives exactly when he means to. He he says a prince is never late." Uh, so uh, that's a fun sort of allusion, deliberate or not, to Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, who says a wizard is never late. Um, but the, but of course, Bran becomes a wizard. It's kind of like Sam says in Game of Thrones season one, where he's like, "Hey, um, where he's like, hey, I always wanted to be a wizard." What, what, all this wizard talk in Game of Thrones. But anyway, so Wyman's like, yo, what's up, Brano? Come sit down. Let's let's have a, a duck. Let's talk politics. Um, he and, and, and Mandley is as windy as he is vast. And Mandley, like, pretty quickly gets down to brass tacks, though. He's like, all right, here's the thing. He, like, lays out his political agenda. He's like, yo, I want my city, White Harbor, to have a mint. We're going we're gonna to have a mint, mint. The mint is going to be mint. We're going to make coinage because, hey, King Rob, he needs his own money because that's what makes the world go around, you know? And you know what else King Rob needs? He needs a war fleet. So give me the gold to build a war fleet and we'll make it super powerful. And by the way, I, had to, I, I happened to notice that Lady Hornwood no longer has a husband. So uh, I think we need to get a husband for... for um, Lady Hornwood, and I would love to be that husband, or my son can be that husband, uh, but but look, all I, everything I'm doing, I'm just doing it to help you and King Rob. Uh, and of course, all these things that Mandalay is describing would massively increase his own personal power. Um, but he's framing it in such a way that it's all about his loyalty to Rob Stark. So... Uh, so this is one of the lessons of this chapter is that it, it, it's all about like brutal ambition basically but you got to couch everything in terms of courtesy and being polite even with like the even with like the phrase it's not about like liking each other it's just about talking as though you like each other it's about those courtesies and those trappings so so when you are screwing each other over you can at least save face and pretend it's about being a good lord um, and when 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 Mandalay mentions commanding a warship, Bran wonders if a cripple had ever commanded a warship. So again, it's that concept of like Bran can't be the person he wanted to be, not at least in the way that he originally planned by being a knight. Um, but he can think of alternative ways of, of of being an influential person, and maybe commanding a warship is a way to do it. I think the only ship that Bran will command is Hodor. I think that I think that Bran will be the captain of the SS Hodor in the sense that Bran will walk into Hodor and steer his body about across across the north, which is a truly disturbing metaphor, but it should be because Bran's control of Hodor is, as we learned an abomination. 
So Manderley, like, spends, like, three pages, uh, like, outlining his, his political ambitions, but framing it in a sense of, like, I'm just trying to help you out, man. I'm just trying to help King Rob, but, but, but Wyman is as Machiavellian as they, as they get. Um, and then uh, Lady Hornwood herself rolls up, Donella Hornwood, who, who looks like a husk of a woman, we're told. She is grief-ridden and she is worn down uh, because of all that she has suffered. But of course, Lady Hornwood is going to suffer a whole lot more uh, because pretty soon Ramsay is going to forcibly marry her and force her to eat her own fingers as she starves to death. Um, so what happened was that Lady Hornwood's uh, husband was killed in the Battle of the Green Fork, uh, and their kid was cut down in the Whispering Woods. Um, and and we're told that Winterfell will remember, uh, but that seems like poor consolation to the grieving Donella Hornwood, uh, whose every line of her face is etched with grief. And Lady Donella, in like sharp contrast to uh, to Wyman Manderley, she's not here for you know big political scheming. She just says, "Hey, I just would love to have a rest, maybe a bit of duck." Like she's just here for recovery. So not everyone is as ambitious as Wyman Manderley. She's just trying to get by. Um, so we have talk of the seasons. Uh, autumn is starting, and so wise men are putting away a portion of the harvest. But everyone's always complaining and, and debating about how much food they should set aside. And spoiler, it's never, it's never enough. Has any, has, has anyone ever put aside a, enough resources for the future? It seems like, it may, like I don't want to be topical, but it seems like political leaders just often don't do the sensible evidence-based thing. There must be times in history when they did. Like was was I mean I guess fundamentally like the problem is that if you're too safe and conservative, empires tend to be steamrolled by other empires, literally or otherwise. You ever hear about the great steamroll empire of um of of the East Indies? They just they just built all these massive bulldozers and just wiped out half, half of Mombasa. It was a nightmare. Um, but they're talking about putting aside food for the autumn and uh, and we are warned by Donella that Bolton's bastard is massing men at the dread fort. Um, and she specifically says that, oh man, he's calling himself a Bolton even though he's actually a snow, like as though Ramsay was a trueborn and had a right to that name. And Donella has like a very personal reasons for talking about the bastard Ramsay in that way, because her dead husband had a bastard son called Lawrence Snow, and I think this I think this negative attitude that that Donella has towards Ramsay's bastardy uh, probably reflects her feelings about her husband's bastard son Lawrence Snow. Uh, so I think that she resents him because they later talk about who will be Donella's heir. And they say that Donella would not want her husband's son, Lawrence, to be that heir. So it's a similar dynamic to what we see with, with Catelyn and her resentment of her husband's son, John, John, Johnny, Johnny Snow, um, who, of course, is not actually Ned's bastard, but spoilers. Um, and we, we, we get this first introduction of like who this guy Ramsay Bolton is. We're told that he's the bastard of the Dreadfort, and he's a sly creature, and he's cruel, and they hunt. They hunt together, the bastard and his servant Reek, and they don't hunt for deer, they hunt for something else, and she's heard tales that she can scarce believe. So this is, like, very similar to the introduction of um, Euron Greyjoy in the books, because Euron gets talked about so much before he actually turns up. It's like a book and a half between Euron being, like, talked about in these little, little vague descriptions of some kind of nasty things. Men say terrible things of Euron Greyjoy, just like men say terrible things of Ramsay in this chapter, but we don't actually find out the specifics. And that's what horror is about, you know? Horror is about engaging the reader's imagination. It's why the alien in the movie Alien is barely seen at all throughout the entire movie, and certainly not in the first half. Because the, the, what, the, the, the person who really knows what, what scares someone is that person themselves. So just, so just sketch the outlines of what horror you want them to imagine, and their imagination will do the work. 
I, I wonder, like, you, you, you could do psychological studies of, like, measuring, like, you do a test of measuring, like, what, uh, what, is the extent of someone's imagination like there's actually there's actually a test that's used in psychology uh to measure someone's creativity and the test is really simple it's like it, it's something along the lines of like oh um list as many things that you can do with a bucket as you can in five minutes or like in 10 minutes and then and then the, and then the task is literally to sit there and say well you can put a bucket on your head you can fill a bucket with honey you can put a hamster in the bucket and tie it to a rope and then swing swing it around your head so that the so that the 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 circular motion keeps the hamster inside the bucket or you can like stack the buckets like the cups and like you can list as many things you can do with buckets as possible and the number of things you think of, that's your score for this creativity test in psychology. Um, and that's how you kind of know psychology is a bit of a meme uh, branch of science. But but that's one of the things they do. And I think you, you could do that uh, and, and, and to measure people's imagination. And then you could measure, you could just ask people like, um, or you could, no, what you do is you'd show them like a, like a horror short film. And then you'd measure how afraid they are. And you would ask them how afraid they are. And you would measure their precision. The, their, their perspiration not their precipitation they probably won't rain um but you would measure that their sweat and their heart rate and you would get an objective measure of like how much fear does this person feel and how much imagination does does this person have and my scientific hypothesis is that you would find a a, a positive correlation between imagination and fear that, that, that's my hypothesis because i think that um I think that fear comes from our imagination of what can go wrong. You know, it's like pareidolia when we see faces in things because our brains are wired to like, when we look at a bush, we're like, is that a tiger? Is that a tiger that's actually wearing a, a bush as a disguise, like a ghillie suit, like those bad guys in, in, in Macbeth? Um, it's our imagination that creates all these potentialities of possible futures in which we get eaten. And that's what motivates us to run the other way from anything that looks like a tiger. Um, uh, did we do another tangent? I think we did. We were meant to be on a lightning round, weren't we, Bilbo? Okay, well, let's, 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 let's meander our, our lightning bolt um, onwards. So... Uh, what, what, how in God did I get talking about that? Okay, we're talking about Ramsey, and he's being introduced as a spooky, spooky boy, um, and Donella Hornwood is like, hey, I think there's a bit of a problem, because this spooky boy, Ramsey Bolton, has got his eyes on my land, um, and I'm scared, and I think he wants to take my land, and... Bran wanted to give the lady a hundred men to defend her rights, uh, but Roderick says, eh, I don't think it's a problem. I don't think Ramsay's a problem. Uh, I think you'll be safe, uh, so don't worry about Ramsay. Just, you know, maybe get married again and a husband will sort you out. And uh, that's what we call a terrible mistake, because, of course, Ramsay is a problem and he does come and forcibly marry uh, Lady Hornwood and starve her to death, so... That's what we call uh, a big fucky wucky in the business. That is a big one of those. And the tragedy is that 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 you know w w there's a lot of talk this chapter about who Lady Donella Hornwood would marry, um, because of because it, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a lady uh, without a husband is in need of a husband. Uh, to, to to paraphrase. Um, a meme. Um, so, so, so the point is, everyone's talking about, oh, who should Danilla Horn would marry? It's like a, it's like a, uh, it's like a game show. I think they should make a game show about who should Horn would marry, and then it'll be like The Bachelor, where all of these win hoary old Winterfell lords are trying to seduce. Lady Danella Hornwood. But the point is that Lady Danella Hornwood has all these suitors. Like Manderly wants to marry Danella, and and Moore's Umber wants to marry Danella. But but it's revealed this chapter that Donella fancies Roderick Cassell. Because because Cassell is like, oh, we'll try and find you a husband. And and Donella says to Roderick, perhaps you need not look very far, sir. And and Lewin is like, Oh, I do think the lady fancies you, Roderick. So, you know, it turns out Donella Donella likes 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 a man with some sideburns, you know? She likes 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 a 
thighs a bit of a tickle, you know? Um, so it's like super fucking kawaii. Like, my, my man, this is kawaii. It's such an, like, I ship them to hell and back. It's such a cute little, little, because it's between, like, side characters, you know? Like, there's something really adorable about the fact that these are just two, like, tertiary characters, quaternary characters, even. Uh, and yeah, they have this little glint of, of happiness, which is just, which is just such a lovely reminder that there is light and there is love in even the most obscure corners of this story. So, I think that's really lovely. But, but ironically and tragically and heart wrenchingly, Roderick condemns Donella to her death unknowingly by choosing not to defend her from Ramsay. So. That's one of the very, very, very many cruel little little tragic stories in Song of Ice and Fire that that Roderick ends up getting his his uh, his crush crushed, for want of a better term. Um, alrighty, so we're talking about Ramsey, and it's a bit of a downer. And um, for some reason, I wrote down a note about Big Ben on this page, and I I cannot for the life of me, think why. Okay, so yeah, we're discussing who Donella should marry, um, and, and Bran thinks about what his understanding of sex is, uh, because because Donella is like, eh, I don't want to marry Wyman Manderley, because I am surely too small and, and frail to lie beneath Wyman Manderley. Uh, my bed is not large enough to hold one of his majesty. And Bran thinks, ah, yeah, no, that, that, that tracks... That makes sense, because Bran knows that men sleep on top of women when they share a bed. Like, that is Bran's understanding of sex. And, and there's, like, a similar thing... Yeah, so, so then Moore's Umber later on, he comes up and he's like, Hey, I want to I wanna marry Danella. And, and Lewin is like, Danella is, is still grieving. And then Moore's is like, I, I've got a cure for her grief right under my furs. Um, so, so, you know, dick joke. And I think it's interesting that all of this is happening in front of an eight-year-old boy, Bran. Like, like since sex is fundamentally part of the feudal system. Like, I mean, I mean that that's why this whole story is so goddamn spicy. Is that is that the sex and the and the conflict is inextricably intertwined because it's all about hereditary monarchy. So, so who's banging who is critically important. Um, because that determines who gets the crowns and who gets the power. It's the bloodlines, you know, who's bastard, who's cheating on who. Like, like one of the, of course, one of the central conflicts at the start of the story is the fact that, is the fact that Cersei's children are not King Robert's. And that fact is part of what starts this massive war. So, so who bangs who is critically important. So, so, so sex is something that needs to be understood to understand the politics. And that's true as well for eight-year-old Bran. And that's also just part of, like, medieval life to a certain extent. Um, like, like, like I, th- I think there's more awareness of sex in some of those societies, I think. Because, I mean, if only because, you know, you, you only have to go down to the stables to see that, oh, you know, animals get on top of other animals and there's little baby animals, you know? Who would have thought? It's it's like death, you know. Death was not so hidden from from societies at a certain point. Hashtag we live in a society. I know, but um, but you know, d- death and sex, I think, could be more visible than they are currently. Um, cause cause where the fuck else are kids gonna learn about this stuff? You know, F- fucking fucking furries dot com. Like like what is people? Kids need to learn one way or another. Is all I'm saying. Um, and I don't know if the way it's happening now is healthy. Anyway, I'll get off my lawn, and, uh, we're up to, we've done the bit about Donella and all of her suitors, and we've talked about Ramsay. Oh, and here's another tragic bit. Here's another really sad bit. So, so with the whole Roderick, Donella little potential romance, they talk about how, oh, it would be so nice if you got married, because then, uh, Roderick's daughter Beth would have a mother, because Donello could be like a mother figure for 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 Beth Cassell, who's like one of the Winterfell girls, um, which is such like a hopeful thought. Um, but of course, Beth Cassell is currently a captive of the Dreadfort after Ramsay attacked Winterfell. Um, so this little moment of hope is is just fucking crushed by um, by this whole sad situation. And Bran's like, ah, I'm only a knight. I'm too old, so I can't be with Danella. So it's a sad, sad missed opportunity as winter sets in. 
So they're discussing who Danella should marry, um, and they talk about how Bran likes to hang out with his direwolf Summer. Uh, meanwhile, Rickon hangs out with his direwolf Shaggy Dog, who is a lean black shape watching from the undergrowth. Uh, and and R- and Rickon and Shaggy Dog come and see Bran as soon as he enters the Godswood, almost as if they had known that they were coming, almost as if they are skin changes and wargs and they're able to uh, psychically sense their, their doggo brethren. Um, so I think I, I think Rickon's a warg as, as well as Bran, and it's going to be so fucking cool when we go to Skargos in the books and we see Rickon hanging out with Shaggy Dog and the cannibals and the unicorns. How could that not be a great time? Well, I'm sure there'll be tragedy alongside the memes. Um, and so they go to the little lake in the Godswood where Lord Eddard used to pray because Ned's shade, Eddard's ghost, is is a part of this story for for a long, long time. His legacy is very important. Um, and but there are there are ripples running along the surface of the water, and for a moment, Bran is baffled. He is vexed. He is bewildered. Um, because there's there's no wind, so why are there these ripples? And then all of a sudden, Osher, the wildling, bursts naked out of the pool like a like a pigeon out of a pie, um, and bursts out of the cold water. And Brown is like, "What? What are you even doing? Like 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 Paul McCartney out of a wedding cake? He's just." bursting out of there, water going everywhere. And Bran's like, Osher, how are you swimming naked in that lake? It's so cold. And Bran's like, oh, um, Osher's like, I suckled on icicles, boy. I like the cold. Um, and Osher's like, oh, haven't you seen a naked woman before? So again, it's that thing about like children seeing uh, nudity and sex and stuff as just like a part of life. Um, Bran looks at Osha's body and sees that she's hard and sharp instead of soft and curvy, and she's covered in scars. Um, so that sort of shows us, you know, how Osha as a woman doesn't fit, like, some models of, like, what a, what a noble lady, plump and noble lady should be like. She's hard and she's scarred because she's a wildling, and that's part of what it means to be a wildling. Um... And uh, and they also there's a little they talk about how the this little lake this little pool in the gods would Osha said she got in there because she wanted to see what what was at the bottom of the pool, um, and Bran says oh I never knew there was a bottom of the pool and Osha says might be there isn't, uh, which is cool because it's like what because because Osha represents magic and mystery whereas. Lewin represents maesters and rationality and science and what is known. Um, and, and I really like that, that sort of distinction between the bottomless pool and the pool with the bottom. Um, because the pool with the bottom is, is the idea that we know everything. Like, there, there's no great mysteries and unknowns out there still. Like, Lewin says there is no magic. The children are dead. Like, like we, we know what there is. Whereas Osh is saying, well, there's magic and mystery. And when there's magic and mystery, there's infinite possibilities, you know? That there exists more in heaven and earth. Um, so, 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 and I think, that, and I think that's sort of like the thing with horror, isn't it? Like, in the same way that horror engages our imagination by, by saying, you know, you can imagine what is, what is terrifying. The fantasy and the magic invites us to engage our imagination, to imagine what what kind of powers and mysteries and beauties and 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 things might there be beyond this bottomless pool in in the lake. You know, is there some kind of ancient squid monster like in like the Watcher in the Lord of the Rings? Is there an ice dragon lurking at the bottom, warming the pools? Is is there a is there a secret Hodor clone facility where you can produce an army of Hodors to to defend the wall? Anything you can imagine could be at the bottom of that pool. Whereas the Maesters world, the, the pool with the bottom is limited, you know? So it's always going to be more fun when, when you don't know if there's a bottom. Um, so uh, chats with Osha, and Osha's like, oh, you know, there's still giants beyond the wall, you know? And Bran says, one day, maybe I'll even see one. Bran still hasn't seen a giant, but I, but maybe he will now that he's up in the north. And of course, you know, the word see is used. And and Osha says, oh, haven't you ever seen a woman before? The word see, the word watch, is constantly used with Bran because that's what he does. He watches, he sees, he has the green sight. 
Um, and maybe it's just it's just confirmation bias because all characters see. But I swear Bran does more seeing than most. So Bran talks about how... Osha talks about how she's killed people and fought people. She's tough. She's a wildling. Um, and Bran almost forgets that she's the woman who once tried to rob and kill him in the Wolf's Wood. Because Osha was... Osha attacked Bran, uh, or at least tried to hold him hostage, so um, it's it's kind of nice that they've overcome that and they're pals now, which is so important because like part of Game of Thrones is about trying to find peace between warring factions. Um, so it's um, so these little friendships between enemies are really important. So they talk about uh, Osha. So, so the wildlings have this great perspective because the wildlings are sort of outside of this like southern political world where you have to be courteous even when you hate each other. That's one of the themes of this chapter is about how like you have to couch your real desires in, in like socially acceptable, polite forms, whereas the wildlings aren't quite like that. So Osha is like, well... It's fucking silly that, that the little Walders would be mocking the giant Hodor. It's a mad world where a cripple has to defend the giant Hodor. So, so the wildlings just sort of see the world for what it is. They don't see all the bullshit political trappings and the courtesies, and they just say, well, it's fucking stupid that Hodor should have to put up with shit from the Walders, you know? Um, so that's part of what the wildlings do, is to, like, strip away those pretensions of the way that feudal society works. Uh, and Hodor has a gentle spirit, we're told, uh, but Osher says that he has hands strong enough to twist a man's head off his shoulders. So I, I'm, I'm certain that, that, just like in the TV show, there'll be a moment when Bran uses Hodor's body for violence, and I think it's going to be something very scary. And Osher says that uh, Walder is, uh, little Walder is big outside, little inside, and mean down to his bones. Uh, the, the Walders are, of course, involved in the Winterfell murders that happen in Book 5, the mysterious murders where no one quite knows who's responsible for them. I, I believe little Walder, who's the big one, is murdered, uh, whereas uh, Big Walder, who's the little one, survives, if I remember rightly. And some people suspect that Big Walder might have murdered Little Walder in order to get ahead on the uh, on the line of succession for House Frey. So there's all sorts of possibilities there. And so Osha asks Bran about his wolf dreams, uh, and Bran tries to say that, oh, I haven't been having wolf dreams, but Osha's like, man... A prince should lie better than that. Osher sees through Bran's lies and realizes that he has been having these magical wolf dreams. So again, the wildling sees right through the bullshit and sees the truth of the matters. And then Bran goes to sleep and he has dreams. He dreams of the weirwood and he dreams of the three-eyed crow. And there are, there are a lot of folks who reckon that the three-eyed crow uh, is not necessarily the same entity as Blood Raven, the dude in the cave. Um, like, we are told in, like, the appendix, and, like, it's, you know, implied that the three-eyed crow who appears in Bran's dreams is a representation of Blood Raven, Brynden, the old man who's, who's stuck in the tree in the cave. But, but, and, you know, it, it's seen as sort of, like, a, 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 a marginal fringe opinion that, like, they are somehow separate entities, and maybe, like, the three-eyed crow has its own agenda separate to Blood Raven's. But, I mean, you know, there is some textual support for that notion that, that, that they are separate entities. But because Bran has a dream of a weirwood, which seems sort of like a separate thing to the Three-Eyed Crow, and the weirwood is also sort of telling Bran things and seems to be Blood Raven. So there's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different interpretations of what's going on here. I, I tend to think that the Three-Eyed Raven, like... It, it, it could be, uh, like, kind of a separate thing in the sense that the Three-Eyed Crow embodies more of, like, the old gods and the children of the forest side of things, but I think it's definitely still connected to and a representation of Blood Raven. Like, probably the biggest evidence that, like, they are separate entities is the fact that when Bran meets Blood Raven in the flesh, uh, Bran is like, oh, are you the Three-Eyed Crow? And, uh, and, um, and Blood Raven is like, a crow? Uh, well, I was in the Night wa Night's Watch once, if that's what you mean. Which seems like Blood Raven doesn't know what Bran is talking about when he talks about the Three-Eyed Crow, you know? But anyway, that's a tangent. Um, and so there's people rocking up at Winterfell for the feast, and uh, and the Umbers turn up, and the Umbers have a banner with a giant 
on their banners. Um, and it's funny that, that Bran sees a giant on the Umber banners just the page after Osha said, hey, maybe you'll see a giant beyond the wall. So, um, so maybe that is fulfilled. So the great John Umbers turn up, the Umbers, and they got bearskin cloaks, and Moore's Umber has, uh, has a missing eye that was eaten out by a crow, so he's got a chunk of dragon glass in his eye socket instead, which is about the most metal thing in this bloody book. Um, so he's called Crow Food because he ate the crow, or he bit off the head of the crow who, who ate his eye. And then his brother Hotha is called Horsbane. And if, if I remember rightly, the reason why Hotha Umber is called Horsbane is because he killed a sex worker. Um, and the secret mystery is that, it, that the secret part of it is that Hotha, um, the, the person who Hotha slept with, was a man. Um, and of course, that is 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 just tragic and hilarious. That the well, more tragic, that like the shameful part is the is the gender of the person who Hotha killed, not the fact that he killed him. You know, um, but that's a little detail. And then Mors is asking to marry Danella, but we talked about that. And Hotha wants ships to deal with the wildlings and stuff, um, and. Sir Roderick says, ah, Lord Manderley is going to build some ships, so you should work with him. Uh, and that might be really significant for the Grand Northern Conspiracy Theory, the idea that even now in the fifth book, when the Boltons are in charge, all these northern houses are actually secretly working with each other to oppose the Boltons. And this connection with the Umbers working with the Manderleys to build ships might be part of it. But of course, with all of Manderley's ambitions... It's it's really more about him getting his own personal power because he's building a royal fleet for King Rob, but, you know, he's building his own damn ships is also what he's doing, and he's building his own damn mint, and he's getting the Hornwood lands, and it's all about gathering his own personal power. Um, so Manderley is ambitious, not only with what's on his plate, but with what's in his holdings feudally. Um, so the Galbert, the Galbert Glover and Robert Glover... Um, have left Deepwood in the hands of Robert's wife, uh, and she's the one who keeps, like, going off to the Godswood to pray, which might be a cover for secret meetings, because that's what Sansa does earlier. And Bran realizes that it's not Lady Go Glover, but the steward who rules Deepwood Mott, and the man had been setting aside only a tenth of his harvest because a hedge wizard had told him that there would be a bountiful spirit summer before the cold sets in. Uh, and Lewin has a number of choice things to say about hedge wizards. I love the idea of a hedge wizard. I think the idea is that it's like a traveling wizard, like a freelance wizard, you know, a freelance sorcerer, you know, gets on gets on Fiverr and says, give me five bucks and I'll summon a rabbit. Like, that's what a hedge wizard does. I like the idea that in the same way that, like, a necromancer controls the dead and, like, a water wizard controls water and a, and a pyromancer controls fire, I like to think that the hedge wizard controls hedges and can just, like, grow hedges with, like, a sweep of his staff. I think that would be fun. Um, I believe that was actually the backstory to the DreamWorks movie Over the Hedge, um, little known lore. Okay, so, uh, so Bran is learning that, ah, oh, you know, this person, this place isn't run by the Lord, this place is run by the steward. So he's learning all the different kind of forms of leadership. Uh, and that's sort of part of the point of this chapter is to just explain the political landscape to us and show that, hey, we got people like Wyman, who's ambitious. And we got people like Donella, who's like being used as a pawn and is vulnerable. And we got people like, like this Glover steward who is making poor decisions, uh, and is sort of running things there. Um, and they talk about how, like, Lewin says that, hey, Bran, one day you'll be a good lord for Winterfell. And Bran says, no, I won't, because Bran will never be a lord, um, because Rob is going to be the <laughs> Rob is going to be the king of the North forever, is what Bran thinks. Um, but of course, maybe one day Bran will become the king of Westeros. And they talk about. And Lewin says, well, you know, it might seem that way, but when we speak of the morrow, nothing is certain. Because, of course, this is a time of change, there's the Red Comet, it's autumn, upheavals can happen at any time. Um, and as an example of the way things can change unexpectedly, Roderick talks about uh, his family, um, because Beth is the only surviving family member for Roderick after... 
uh, after Roderick's brother died and all of his brother's sons died, uh, after Jory, the, the loyal guard Jory, was, was slain in Book 1. So it, it's a really tragic family story that's happened to the Cassells with all the horrible things that happened to, to Jory and, and Beth being captured and Roderick being killed. And the Cassells have been nothing but loyal to the Starks, and yet they've suffered the most, because in the Game of Thrones, it is the Cassells who suffer most. Uh, and the tall hearts roll up, and, uh, and, and, and Leobald tall hearts talks about how his son has raised a company of teenagers who ride about the north, calling themselves the Wild Hares, singing songs of chivalry, uh, which sounds like an awful lot of fun, and it's exactly the sort of indulgence that, um, we, we, we lose in the later books when things get grim and cold and bloody. Uh, and, of course, Leobald Tallheart, if I remember rightly, get, gets murdered outside Winterfell uh, when Ramsay rolls up. So, you know, it, it's so sad, like, rereading this stuff and, uh, and reading all these characters and remembering all the horrible things that happened to them later. Uh, and, of course, <laughs> and of course, Leobald Tallheart also has a go at trying to wheedle his way into the Hornwood lands, because it's all about ambition wrapped in courtesy, like, 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 like a pill wrapped in honey. Um, or like a or like a dead hedgehog wrapped in bubble wrap. It's all about finding a a a, a, a more acceptable packaging to put the difficult and uh, thing in. <clears throat> so uh, Leobold looks on Bran with pity, and Bran hates that pity. He hates the man for a moment. So Bran is still struggling with with his feelings over his disability and the way people are treating him and they talk more about the hornwood land and what to do with it and the bastard of dreadfort who everyone's like no nah, that won't be a big deal and then they talk more about howland reed the Cranigman, and how he has not left his swamps for many a year and like with all this build up with howland like it's just like the pattern with euron and the pattern with um and the pattern with with ramsay and all these people who get mentioned 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 before they appear the build up has been so long with howland reed we've been blue balling on howland reed for so long I think he's got to rock up and be awesome at some point. I mean, of course, like, the other thing is that this book was meant to be a trilogy. So all this, like, slow foreshadowing was probably not meant to be that slow. Because when George was dropping hints in the first book, he thought he was going to wrap up the series in just two more books. So, like, it's probably um, accidentally elongated, all of that foreshadowing. Uh, so they... So Clay, Clay Kerwin rocks up and he's like a friend of Bran and Bran uh, and Clay calls out cheerfully and says good morrow Bran or must I call you Prince Bran now and Bran says ah, only if you want so like so much of this chapter is about like you know courtesy being used to to hide the sort of true politics but we we learn that this sort of genuine relationship that Bran has with Clay like in a real friendship you can drop the courtesy and you can just talk for real like it's like how you talk you call your friends cunts and you call your cunts friends like that's how that's how that's how it works sometimes the language of friendship is um is the real and true and honest one and indeed the foul-tongued one so clay is like man everyone's a fucking king now did you hear that stannis is calling himself a king now yeah story is that uh cersei's son joffrey is a bastard joffrey the ill-born small wonder he's faithless with a kingslayer for a father the gods hate incest. And at the moment at that moment that, that Clay Kerwin mentions Jamie Lannister, the Kingslayer, for a moment Bran could not breathe. A giant hand was crushing his chest. Another giant mention after the, the talk of giants that, that Bran will see in earlier pages. But Bran suddenly freaks out. Um, he, he clutches desperately at Dancer's reign. He feels terror. Bran has this sudden inexplicable reaction to hearing the name Jamie Lannister. Uh, the blood is roaring in his ears, and he sort of runs off. And then he has another dream, and he has the three-eyed crow pecking at his forehead because Hodor's uh, bread incident did not do the job, I suppose. Um, and, and, and the crow pecks at his brow, and bits of bone and brain come out. And, and Bran remembers clinging to a tower and his fingers slipping. 
and then the golden man, Jamie Lannister, appears in the sky above him. The things I do for love, he says, and tosses him kicking into the air. So we realize that, that the reason why uh, why Bran freaked out when he heard the name Jamie Lannister is because in some deep subconscious depth of his mind, he, he sort of actually does remember that Jamie is the person who pushed him. Um, but he's sort of suppressing that memory from himself. So this is like a suppressed memory. Um, and it's actually really interesting in the real world, like the history of the concept of suppressed memories, because there have been, there have been people who have claimed to specialize at finding people's suppressed memories. Um, but there have been allegations that some of those suppressed memory therapies are actually creating new memories that never actually happened and and and, and people are being manipulated and people are uh, misremembering things in ways that are negatively impacting people it's quite a fascinating thing uh, suppressed memories in, in the real world um but the point is that we're talking about game of thrones and we've just reached the end of the chapter and this chapter i think was all about uh, politics and how politics works and how it's about being ambitious but by being courteous with your ambition um, and we learn about all these important players Wyman and Ramsey and the Hornwood lands and all these and all these tall hearts and umbers and and Kerwins and all the all this all, all these swirling connections which become uh, even more relevant in the later books in, in like book five as sort of the Grand Northern Conspiracy and some of those connections and resentments and conflicts still continue to be important and at the same time all this political stuff is is a distraction it's it's the B story to the real A story which is which is the fucking zombie apocalypse that's about to happen winter is coming so Bran is going to have to face the real issue the real problem in this world very soon because he has the sight to face it. Uh, and though Bran is frustrated with, with, with the limitations that he has as a result of his disability, he is finding alternative ways to express his power and to be relevant and to be able to play a role in the world, just like Wyman Manderley has found alternative ways of, of using his abilities, and, and, and Brienne has, and, and he's riding around on Hodor like a hot air balloon, and there's all these different ways of um, getting shit done but let's just hope that we don't do too much abomination before the dawn comes cool smart reel so thanks for listening to this episode of game of thrones abridged on alt swift x remember to subscribe to the podcast there's a podcast feed so you can listen to every episode on audio on your device of choice um and press like and press subscribe and press all the buttons and we'll do another episode sometime hopefully uh, sooner than, the, than this one took. We have been slow, and I won't make any promises, but hopefully we will do more. I hope you're all well. I hope you're all having a good time. I hope you're all keeping safe. Um, and uh, have a good one. Cheers.